Sounds good. Um, what we got is we've got uh, check in tomorrow night. It's from 5 to 8 p.m. Uh, it's at the fish market down South Street. You can drop your board off um, there if you want, just your board. Um, but they can only take boards that are no longer than 14 feet. Um, the reason for that is basically this time last year and the years prior, what they're going to do is they're basically going to yeah. snap so the uh, inside. No. You know, Can't hear you. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Let me see. Um, it's all the background noise. I'm not sure what to do either. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah. Better? Yeah, that's much better. Okay, cool. All right, so I think I got to figure it out for now. Uh, I'm in a... Uh, I'm in some sort of bus station in New York. So, all right, let's go over the agenda real quick. What we're going to do is we're going to go through the uh, weather conditions real quick, go through the event schedule, the race course, uh, and cover any logistics and questions we've got. Uh, next slide, John. Okay, the weather conditions. Hey, this I made this slide a couple days ago. I actually just checked the weather um, recently, and I'm sure we're all checking the weather like every five minutes. But it's actually looking really good for Saturday morning. Um, we're looking at probably race temperatures. Um, right around 80 degrees um uh, and that's including the heat index or all with the heat index. i don't know we'll see, either. now that's that, you got me now you're perfect now don't move okay i didn't do it all right, all right. i'm not gonna move heat index okay heat index is looking like it's around 85 to 88 so that's actually looking pretty good just make sure you guys are all hydrating really well and wear sunscreen and do all the things you would do you know for paddling in warm weather but we're not looking like any kind of uh, crazy heat wave um Let's talk about the tides. John, can you go to the next slide? Um, okay, event schedule real quick. Um, okay, so for Friday, board drop-off and pre-registrations from 5 to 8. You can drop your board off, um, and they'll take anything that's 14 foot and under. They cannot store unlimited. Understand this, though. What they're probably going to do, if it's like years past, is they're going to stack all the boards on top of each other in a rental truck or in a little warehouse near the near the start yeah. line. Um so just be aware of that. You may want to keep it in your board bag or if you want to bring it at the start in the morning. Um, that's what I do. I don't want my board stacked up with seven other boards on top of it right before a big race. That's just me. Um, okay. Saturday morning, uh, you're going to need to get there, you know, no later than 9 a.m. Because they're going to, even if you go to pre-registration. Cool. So everybody can hear me. Um, I've got a pretty good connection here you know steve and and trish are traveling and doing the best they can so steve put a lot into this um i'm going to post this you guys can see the um there's going to be i'll just walk through it really quick steve's got a tide schedule on here showing you exactly where the tides are uh, which is amazing um you've got a map of the start so that you can see by the brooklyn bridge um, I've done the race twice. I've finished at the Brooklyn Bridge and started at the Brooklyn Bridge in different years. Um, so uh, what I can tell you about the Brooklyn Bridge start is there's a little bit of a bridge. You have to climb over a little bit of a barrier. It's not a big deal. Um, you do have to watch your footing. You do have to watch your um, – uh, there are rebar, some glass, you know, your basic city stuff on a beach below a bridge. Um, but it's not a big deal. They'll get you in the water. Um, just really be careful with your footing at the beginning so that you don't, um, cut yourself. Um, I know some people wear some types of, uh, water shoes or even sneakers or other things, um, might be a good idea, but it's not entirely necessary. Just, just don't go throwing your board in the water. Like, um, you know, like a Kyle Lenny and trying to jump on it, you know, like those guys can, and we can't, um, then you'll hang out. There's a big eddy area right there. So there's a lot of current moving through in the East river, but the eddy area is really nice. So you'll be able to sit out there and float. Uh, there are, um, when we started and we gathered right there by South street seaport, it was, um, it was phenomenal. We were all just introducing each other and, and, um, it was great. The, um, it's obviously a water start. Um, you can see the board st staging area that Steve has put on here. Um, and, um, it's incredible. It's right below the Brooklyn bridge. Um, make sure you take a second to look around and 
Um, and there is a grand piano at the start of the water, apparently, Gary. Uh, Rancourt just told us so. There was. Um, like, lots of water in the East last River. Last year or the year before, um, there was. I don't think there was this year. Yeah. Um, so, Trish, you're back. That's cool. Um, everyone can hear Trish, too. Um, and, Trish, if you want to, uh, do you have any other comments about the start? Um, and, and the definitely. Um, just pay attention to what race you're actually raising. I know a lot of people will get excited and start in like the um the charity race and then there's the elite race that starts at 10. um and it happens every year like you know some people start at nine some people start at 10 but just try to calm your nerves and and relax and if you're staying it for the elite race stay till till 10 and when they uh, blow the whistle it's kind of common for that to happen yeah that's good some people yeah. it's happened every year that i was there too um and uh, um, you, this photo is great that Steve has. It's and it shows you all of the, you know, the broken pilings, the rebar, that kind of stuff. You know, it's it's not bad. Um, it's not super slippery, but there are some slippery spots. Um, and um, this is another shot, which uh, you can see. Uh, it's just actually the view is amazing when you see people going up. So um, let's move on to the next one. Um, this is a a map of when you get past the Brooklyn Bridge, which is down towards the bottom left, you'll see that there is uh, Roosevelt Island. And, um, you know, you're just starting out. You're going to go around, uh, go to the left of Roosevelt Island and um, underneath the Queensboro Bridge. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing going through there. Um, looks like we've got a note saying the elite race is at 930, not 10 o'clock. So um, keep an eye out for that. Um, one of the comments that just came up from Gary is the – I'm sorry. Yeah, from Gary is the um, uh, the barges. Um, there are a lot of large barges moving up and down the river, and they kind of – their uh, their wakes are a little bit different than your basic uh, displacement-type hull wake. Um, sometimes they push down. Um, and not necessarily out. It's just really got to watch out. Don't go anywhere near a barge. Um, they won't move for you. And also, um, the river is uh, along the side of the river, the city side. Um, the, the docks, a lot of the docks and a lot of the structure is undercut. So the water flows underneath the island as opposed to bouncing off. So you don't want to get too close to the city on a lot of the sides. Just, just as another you know, warning. Um, now the, um, Hellgate, um, uh, Jules, who, uh, is up in Manhattan kayak reminded us that it's Hellgate, not Hell's Gate and things just sink here. Um, that is up where the, uh, Harlem river and the East river meet. Um, the two times that I crossed it, uh, one time was really hairy. I just flew right through it. I basically, um, there's a phrase that we called bath kitty. Um, you imagine that you're a cat that someone's trying to throw into a bathtub and you know how they scratch and yeah, think about that when you're going through there, grab your board, you know, get on a knee if you have to, sometimes it's, it's crazy. And then the other year there wasn't anything. Yeah. We floated right through there and it just, yeah, there were a couple of boils. At so, this time, um, everything, is that your I experience think, too, Trish? Uh, you won't even have a problem with it the last couple of years, you know, you just hug the left side, you'll, you'll look back and say, wow, that's Hellgate. Um, the, the way they this is, is really good. Um, and you have the tide with you going up, so. It's awesome. Yeah, it's, um, uh, you'll pretty much, most likely most of you will take the line that the person in front of you takes. So this is another case where, as you're going through, you know, always pay attention to the water. The person in front of you might not know the best way. Um, they'll follow the course, but, you know, pay attention to your lines. Um, pay attention to the water, where the currents and the eddies are. And if you have uh, GPS on your board, this is a great opportunity to look at it. Because a lot of times you'll be going and um, all of a sudden you'll feel like you hit a wall. And what happened is you're actually hitting slow water. Um, and... Uh, uh, so you can see when your your speed goes from, say, six miles an hour 
to three miles an hour suddenly, you might have hit an eddy. So it's pretty good uh, on this course to serpentine and find the fast water. Um, sometimes the difference between, say, 10 and 20 yards um, can be the difference between um, four miles an hour and eight miles an hour, depending on the tides. Um, somebody asked more about the tide forecast. Uh, we'll try and get back to that um, at the end. Uh, yeah, let me see. It was. Oh, and um, one more. They, they will have uh, Here it is. jet skis and, uh, and support boats moving you to the left side. So if you are right in the center of the river, um, they will push you over to the left, you know, so just be aware that like for safety concerns, um, the jet skis and everything will, will be directing you towards the center. Um, and this will be, they'll, they'll do, um, you know, director's announcement in the morning too, to reinstill that again. But just in case ever anyone's out in the middle of the river, they're, they'll want to push yeah. you to the left. And keep in mind, there is water support and there is safe, there are safety boats, but mm -hmm. you really are going into this, um, with the plan that you will be completely self-supported. Um, it, you get very hot, uh, and, um, just make sure you bring enough. I, uh, in the two times that I went, I had two different camelbacks and I just swapped out in the middle. Um, and, uh, there are a lot of posts and a lot of, um, people that are, that'll be able to help you with exactly how many ounces to take and that kind of stuff. I know that Steve has some of that in here too. Um, so the Brooklyn Bridge, um, so this is the tide chart. Let me see. So this is where everything is kind of, you see how there's different highs for different areas of this course. Um, and the fact that it's starting, the elite course is starting at 930. Um, you'll have an incoming tide. Um, it looks like all the way up till uh, you hit the, um, somewhere in the Harlem <laughs> River. Um, the Harlem River is going to be kind of a slack tide. Um, and then when you hit the Hudson River, it'll already be, you know, as long as it's after 1118 at the George Washington Bridge, basically you're going to have an outgoing tide. So um, the one thing to consider is that the slack tide area um, is going to be the area you're going to be doing the most physical work. The When you're with the tide at the beginning, it's going to you're going to be flying, and then you'll slowly get less and less aid as you're going up to the Harlem river. And then when you get on the George, uh, under the George Washington, you'll hit that fast outgoing tide. Um, you know, one thing that, uh, a lot of people will do depending on the, the wind, because it looks like there's going to be a Southwest wind, which is, I believe what, um, Steve, let me just, uh, look at this again. The, um, yeah, South, South East winds at, at 10 15. So what that means here is that you're going to have um, wind in your face going down the Hudson, which again, the wind forecasts constantly yep. change. But if you're going to have wind against tide, um, you'll have chop. Um, so as you're going south on the Hudson, the places with the greatest current are going to have the most chop. So the tendency is, is to make sort of work the balance between how comfortable are you in the chop and how much do you want to get out? Cause you might be in an area with no shit, no, um, chop, mm -hmm. but that means that you're in an eddy. So, um, uh, there's the boat base in the 86th street that a lot of people tend to go in through those boats because it's a lot more calm. Um, but in effect, you're basically going either against an eddy or with no tide when out in the sort of rougher area you can be going uh, when we were with the tide and against the wind um, a few years ago, we were hitting speeds of, I think I was hitting 8.3 miles yeah, an hour. With it, the tide. It's very even in how um, fast you will be going with that, with that moving water, even with some breeze in your face and everything too. Um, but the Harlem too, it's just, it's a great time yeah. to maybe even like refuel, get your mental clarity back. Um, it's, it's a beautiful area of the saddle, you know, take the time, look at Yankee stadium on your right as you're going down. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful oh, yeah. area, um, all the way down up or up the Harlem river. Yep. And one of the great things that we did on their first trip was if you are, um, if you are trying to just finish this, if you are not trying to compete for a place, 
the difference between six hours and 10 minutes and six hours and 15 minutes doesn't really make a big deal to you. What we did was we actually sat down and we ate a sandwich up on the Harlem River um, by the cloisters because it was so beautiful. We just sat on our boards, we split a sandwich. And again, it was, you know, the difference between that five minutes of sit down and actually have a, a sandwich and talk to each other and then get refueled and got back up and finished. Um, it made a world of difference because you really need to stop and check everything out. The cloisters and the Harlem River, um, you won't even believe that you're there's, in New York. It's like, yeah, it's just beautiful. Um, I'll buy like the um, Columbia uh, rowing house. They have the, the big sea. Definitely check out the big sea. Yeah. It's, it's a great place to be present and paddling in. Yeah, that, that rowing house, that mm -hmm. boathouse is insane. It's, it's like, it's idyllic there. There is like a, um, um, uh, a sort of a, I don't even know what you would call it. It was like a, uh, lean to community made of, um, it's not really homeless, but, uh, I guess it is. And they have, um, you know, they've made like a little town up there, um, along the water at one point. So you'll see a lot of hand lines and, um, uh, I remember going by one of them and saying, any luck? And he said, I haven't caught one of these 12 foot long fish I keep seeing yet. And um, so they were pretty cool. Everybody warned us not to go too close because sometimes they throw stuff. I never saw anything <laughs> like that in, in any of the times that I paddled. Um, but people will wave and stuff. It's a lot of fun. But um, the Cloisters is is amazing. Um, the um, This is, um, yeah, there it is. So this is, okay, so this is right as you're coming out of the Harlem River and um, the small bridge goes into the Hudson. So that's actually Amtrak goes over there. Um, and um, that's actually exactly where we stopped to have our sandwich. Um, and it was a meetup. Everybody stopped there. So it was, it was wonderful. Um, then you have, um, this is the George Washington bridge. Um, so as you go uh, under the George Washington bridge, there's a, a incredible lighthouse and um, um, and I'm not sure how many paddle monster people are going to do this. Um, hopefully you guys will all be able to meet up uh, with Steve and um, Tony's going to be there. Um, um, Anthony uh, Gelong and um, a couple other people. So we'll keep that posted now. Um, so the Riverside Park Pier uh, looks like this is the last, um, this is the Hudson River section. One of the things you really want to uh, pay attention to here is um, uh, I think one of the, the warnings was there's a water treatment plant with underwater uh, intake fans. Um, we never saw a vortex or any kind of thing like that, so I wouldn't worry about that. But there are ferries as you get down <laughs> past the Upper West Side. Now, <laughs> Trish, did you ever see the underwater intake fan? No, but that right around that area where there's um, a very recognizable water treatment plant, um, when, the, when the wind is coming right from the south there, it's a great place just to refuel if you need to get your mental state back. Um, because, you know, you've got a bit more to paddle. So I know I've stopped with other paddlers in previous years and talked, chatted, refueled. Great place to just get your mind right to get back into it. You know, um, it's, it's a really safe little area You're away from the wind and tide. So you can plan out it. It's like a nice little refuel area. Yep. And, you know, we just did have a question about what does it mean? High tide. Um, they're thinking ebb and flood. But um, so, uh, Dolio, the high tide is um, we just might be using different terms, but low tide and high tide. Mm -hmm. Uh, what that was showing is that there are different tides at different times uh, based on the course. Um, this is a um, uh, this is a tide dependent. Even though it's a river, the the incoming and outgoing tides change the velocity of the water. So um, high tide it seems to be ranging from um, ten forty to say eleven thirty. Um, and it just gives you an idea of when the tides will be moving at its most, at, at its fastest points. Um, at the beginning of a tide change, the hour before and after high or the hour before and after low are the least amount of flow. And then mid tide is the greatest amount of flow. There's a little, um, like a 12 hour little chart that 
I, maybe I'll find and post for you guys so you can see the flow. Um, then um, Riverside Park uh, Pier. Uh, this is down. Uh, this is on the west side. Um, this might be a good place if people are coming to watch you. Maybe they can go up to Riverside Pier to see you come by because you go by pretty pretty close and they can take photos. Um, I've had family try and meet me at different spots, um, and um, it didn't work out because they were taking subways and it didn't work out at all. But I know um, some people will they just plant themselves here and know that's where they're going to come by between four and five hours, whatever. Um, it might be a good spot. I think that's why Steve has this, and this is Riverside looking south. Um, one thing when you're going down the Hudson that's amazing is um, the Intrepid, uh, the battleship. Uh, I'm sorry, the aircraft carrier. It's it's, it's unbelievable. It's a great spot and right there. And, and Trish, all along, like handle... the piers and everything, you know, random people are fishing and doing other stuff, and uh, they're so supportive. And you'll find people are yelling and cheering you on, which is it's just great. It's really cool to paddle next to those piers. Yeah. And then um, I think I just lost John. Okay, the the um, I think everybody, I think you still have. Um, so the water taxis uh, are not concerned with you; they don't see you. All right. And um, here I'm just gonna. Not really sure what's going on. I might have lost connection or everyone else has. All right. All I'm right. back. Um, there you go. All right. Yep. Cool. Great. Thanks, John. All right. Um, yeah, I think cool. And I haven't seen Steve come right back now. yet. Maybe he's trying another location. Um, and, uh, yep. Gary, I am doing the elite um, race at scheduled at 10 o'clock. Um, that's what our last uh, email was sent. And, you know, keep in mind, too, um, the the people that are in charge of this race, too, they have a phenomenal, uh, you know, uh, responsibility on their shoulders, too. They're, they'll definitely try to get everyone out on time. But if it runs a little late, you know, it runs a little late try to be very patient with it there's a lot of stuff going on um it's new york city which is very cool you're in you'll be in new york city so uh just try to have some patience if it runs after 10 or not you know um safety is always like their number one concern so um so things might not run you know to schedule but it's around that time and and they're usually very very uh clear with what the instructions are while we're on the water um and uh, and definitely before before they they sound any alarms for to let us go, um, they're yep, very and, clear and with, they, um, with our instructions. You know, from the the first couple of years to this now tenth year, um, they have so much experience. Uh, you know, in the first couple of years, a lot of the the safety boats were up front because everyone was excited. Um, but now they realize that sometimes the people in, that the people in the back tend to need need the support a little bit more than the people in the front. They do a great job of sweeping and. Um, even when I did it last five years ago, um, they were uh, they were phenomenal as far as checking in with us. But again, self-supported, bring more than you think you need. Um, oh, and we haven't mentioned this, but leashes, people, um, wear a leash and um, bring a wear a PFD. Yeah, don't just put it on your board. Um, if you got a, a belt one, um, wear that. And also, if you have a leash and you've got a um, um, like a calf leash or a um, uh, re release, uh, like release or one of those um, quick releases. That's also really good too. But um, um, I think one thing that I remember in the East River, because I didn't have a leash the second time that I did it, um, the current was moving so quickly. And if I had fallen off my board, it would have been very easy for me to get separated from it. Um, there the the bridge supports in particular the mm. the current goes around them like a um probably not a cat a cat three like you know like more like a two um white water um so but you definitely flow so you get separated from your board it'd be tough yeah. to get back and you know mm. again there's eddies and stuff so i wouldn't mess around um i don't know if they're going to let anybody get in there without a leash but um 
it, it's possible because uh, I think they are they're mandatory. They're I mean yeah. pretty much I, I think so too. But I think across the board sure. they're mandatory now, um, you know. And yeah. um, the so then the the ferries, um, there are two things that I noticed. One is um, they move faster than they think they are than you think they are. Um, and the second thing is you do have a lot of room. Um, I never felt like I had the taxis. Here are the sections where the water taxis are. When I went through these zones, there were plenty of water taxis going around, but I saw them coming. Um, I never tried to, you never play chicken with them. You never try and beat them. Just wait a second and they'll go by. Um, they're not going to, you know, I don't think anybody, um, I don't think you're in danger of getting hit by them. I mean, of course, anything can happen, but, um, you know, and, and along those lines with boat safety, remember, uh, you do not have the right of way. Um, they don't know that they don't care that you're in a race. They don't care that you're in first. They don't care who you are. They have the right of way. So it's your job to make sure that you've taken time to, um, uh, to get around them. Uh, and, uh, but I, I don't think there have been very many interactions with boats from the, the paddlers. So um, it's not a major concern. Um, what I can tell you, one yeah. of the, yeah, go for it, Trish, sorry. I think it's like kind of, um, oh, it's just common sense. When something yeah. bigger than you is on the water, you move out of the way. She knows about boats. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, uh, technically, an un, you know, a, a man-powered vessel would have the right of way, but I'm not about to debate nope. that if the um, taxi's in front so of me. The, <laughs> I think the first time that you see the water taxi area is after you um, pass the Riverside Park Pier. So you'll see that, you know, we had some photos of that earlier. Um, so this mm -hmm. is, uh, you'll see this pier and that'll be your first visual cue to, to let you know you're about to enter the water taxi zone. Um, and um, you'll be going through that water taxi zone all the way to the finish line. So you'll go over the um, uh, you'll go over the Lincoln Tunnel, and um, uh, and the final half mile you'll be going by Chelsea Piers. Um, you know, one of the things about the when you get to this after you get past the uh, the park, you're going to get an amazing view of downtown. <laughs> Don't waste your time. Like, I mean, I know you're going to be in a hurry to finish, but just check it out. That Intrepid going by the, the aircraft carrier, then you see the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. It's really cool. And just remember that I, there, I highly doubt anybody will have seen the city from your vantage point at any point during this. It's like you're one of maybe four people that will ever see it from any moment. And um, uh, it's amazing that it's an island, but it's so many, it's just doesn't seem like it sometimes. I lived there for 13 years and I didn't go in the water once um, until I left. So, um, um, which, let me see, leads us to the finish line. Um, when you see Chelsea Piers, there'll be boats, people will be yelling, you won't miss this. Um, there's plenty of room, you come in. Trish, they've always had like a floating uh, like dock kind of thing, right? Is that how you got out? Yeah. Uh, at, at, the, at the very end, yeah. Once you see that, if you see that corner right there with the pilings, the beginning of that uh, that building right there, um, there's there's flags out there and there are people taking pictures and that's where they take your time. So you cross that line. So where the the arrows are with the dots, from that time onto the dock, I mean, you you know, you can lay down if you want. Usually everyone takes a break. Your race is done at the solid line, like at the very left of that picture. So one, once you, you know, pass uh, the building right there, you know, everyone is yelling to you, say, hey, what's your number? It's written on your arm or your leg. They'll take your number and your time. And then just enjoy that little, you know, bit of time as you paddle down, say hi to the people next to you. Um, it's a great time because the race is over then, you know, so just... Take your time getting back to the dock and they've got a billion board handlers there yeah. and people now, that are really, the, really um, happy to see you. So. Uh, I guess what we'll do now is we'll go to the, um, the questions. Um, so if you have questions, there's a tab 
by the chat that has questions. And um, I think the the first question um, uh, we've talked about the currents at Hell Hellgate, um, and it doesn't look like that's going to be much of a concern. If you hug the left, there'll be the jet skis are going to be pushing you to the left. So that was from Dolio. Um, the Jim Rothwell is asking about the logistics around the start, like parking and getting board bags from the starting line and the finishing line. Um, so if you want to address that, Trish, if you. Yeah, sure. Um, I know um, Chris Makiak sent, um, I might be saying his last name wrong. I uh, sent a um, PDF not too long ago, maybe an hour or two ago. Uh, in your Oops. Looks like we lost email Trish. if you're registered you already have your board at the at the race start um you'll drop off your bag at um at one of the tents that they have and then they transport your bag so basically your bag with shampoo or whatever or change of clothes to the finish line so they they transport that um however if you're dropping off your board the morning of uh, i don't know if that was just cut off uh, if you're dropping off your board the morning of, um, you want to park your car at the Chelsea Piers, and they have a um, uh, basically taxi uh, taking you back to the finish line. So bring your paddle and bring your shower bag to the finish line, or sorry, the start line. Um, they'll transport it to the finish line for you where your car is parked too. Um, yeah. I don't know if that, that answered it basically. Um, yep. Now, um, so the next question is from Uvi. Um, board choice. Okay. Full uh, John cut off a little bit. I guess uh, I do remember reading this question. Um, full displacement over maybe a surf style board or an inflatable board. Um, definitely, I would recommend a um, displacement board. Uh, although, if you're not familiar with paddling such a board, Today wouldn't be the first day to try it out. Uh, try something, you know, ride something you're familiar with paddling. Um, I know we've all done it where everyone, you know, recommends don't try anything new on race day. Um, for a 25 mile, 26 mile race, you don't want to be uncomfortable on your board, you know, you still want to have a good time. So paddle something you're familiar with. Um, if you have that choice, if you're familiar with both your displacement or your inflatable or your, um, surf style board go with the displacement it's going to be a lot easier for you it's you know you're going to cut through the water a little bit faster than an inflatable board um but again i stress some paddle something that you're comfortable with not outside of your means because obviously you want to enjoy this race and you don't want to spend it falling off and you know, jumping back on the whole time so yeah. Now, one of the questions from Dolio was how you prepare the board itself. And um, uh, I had two different um, hydration packs. I had one on my deck that I had secured with a um, with suction cups, actually. And um, and the other way I prepared my board was I went through a basic uh, gear check before I got into the water or before I left, actually. So what that means is you check your leash string. Um, because some of us have used things like shoelaces and other things, but if it's frayed and it breaks, then it doesn't matter if you have a leash on, it's going to come right off. So check your leash string, um, check your fin and your fin screw, fin screws, um, will corrode. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that that fin is in the box. You want to bring an extra fin screw. People may or may not have one. Um, sometimes a little bit of cardboard or, um, plastic as a shim, with that fin if it's a little bit loose, uh, but definitely check your fin, check your, your screw, make sure whatever screw you have, you have the right screwdriver for that screw. Yeah. So if you have a Phillips head a screwdriver and you have a flathead screw, it doesn't really help you. People again will have screwdrivers, I'm sure, but those, those, um, uh, the fin screws are hard to find. <laughs> so, um, you don't want to mess that up. The other thing is, uh, make sure you check your PFD. Um, I didn't realize that my PFD didn't have my CO2 in it. And I forgot that a year ago I went through airport security and they took my CO2. So, um, it's not a big deal, but if I'm going to wear a PFD and it's going to be an inflatable, 
And if I'm going to pull that string and need it, I'm going to be really upset when it doesn't work. So part of your check could be just replacing your CO2. Um, uh, again, in eight years, I've only had it exp uh, once where I've used it, and that was by accident. But I would hate to think that if I needed it, it wasn't there, and I'd have to blow it up manually. The other thing is that all of us are wearing them backwards. So remember, the PFD actually goes in the front, not in the back, because when you pull it, it'll open up behind you. Um, it actually opens in the front, and then you pull it over your head. Um, it's one of those common things that I see all the time. Uh, and then um, as far as preparing your board for speed, a lot of people like to put some type of product like a, an on it on there. Um, um, there's a lot of uh, schools of thought of whether that works or not. Um, I, I, I can't really speak that I've, I've tried it. Some people swear by it. Some people don't, you know, um, and Trish, how do you prepare your board and your gear? Um, basically j just, you know, just a mental check going over everything, making sure that you have everything you want on there too. Um, uh, I don't, I'm kind of on the same camp. I'm, I, I'm, I, I don't normally put like an on it pro or anything on the board. Um, I understand, you know, the philosophy behind it. Um, and I think, uh, you know, some people are just, uh, that they, they take to it a little bit more. Um, I've never really gotten into it. Um, but, uh, I mean, it, it, it's such an important point about your leash to, you know, make sure that that, you know, whatever you're attaching the leash plug to like that cord is, uh, is, um, you know, is strong and sturdy too, you know, um, yep. and yeah, just check the suction cups, anything that you have on your board, anything you wanted to bring with you, you know, make sure that, uh, that you've got it. Yeah. Yep. And now yep. that yep. kind of leads us into the nutrition and hydration question. Um, and that is a uh, uh, wait am i cutting off for people um what i could do is just join real quick again all right sorry about that ah yeah see you now. okay so um yeah. as far as the um uh, that that leads us into the nutrition and hydration. And one of the questions from John Judge is, can we get recommendations on nutrition and hydration before and during the race? And should they be carbo loading today and tomorrow? You've won. Um, oh man, that's I so Steve. Uh, that's so Steve's area too. Um, I know. Written some great articles. Uh, if anyone you know wants to look them up too, they're on Distress Mullet. Just put in this little search tab nutrition steve um but uh basically I, I, I agree with a lot of what um steve posts to um definitely uh if you're going to carbo load don't do it the night before do it either uh tomorrow night or sorry tonight <laughs> tonight or uh tomorrow morning you know get some um uh, maybe spelt pancakes, like something that takes a long time to break down because your body will take about 18 hours to break that down, you know, um, and uh, don't do anything unusual too. You know, if you normally drink a glass of wine at night, have a glass of wine, it's fine. You know, I, I, the best advice I was ever given was that, you know, do something that your body is used to doing. If you wake up in the morning and you have a cup of coffee, go ahead and do that. You know, it's, you don't want to throw your body off of any normal patterns that it's not used to because you think it's maybe healthier or better for your performance because then you'll get all down on yourself. You know, um, just, just do the best that you can really try to read your body, you know, and, um, uh, continue that pattern that you've had throughout training also. And, you know, if you've been training for this race for however long you can tell what you need, or if you need to, um, you know, uh, take more water in, especially the, in the next couple of days, something like that. Yeah. And I, um, you know, I, I can't agree with Trish more on don't do anything you don't normally do the, whatever way you've been training, like don't try anything new. Um, you know, slight variations are fine, but, um, even those, uh, I've made some big mistakes when I went to, uh, when I did Catalina last year, uh, I, had trained eating um, foods that I made out of the uh, um, portables book. It's a, a scratch nutrition does a um, 
hey, basically you're eating real food. And then when I went to Catalina, I freaked out and I went for gels and bars. And um, it was bad. <laughs> it was really bad. Um, so whatever you're used to, uh, just keep using that same system. And, um, you know, one gel versus another, you know, one flavor versus another, it's, it's not a big deal. But um, uh, don't be afraid to just go. Don't be afraid to trust what you've been using. Um, now, if you haven't been using anything in your practice and you're like, okay, it's race day and I know I have to do six hours instead of two, um, there are some uh, – you may want to try a few tastes tomorrow of things you might use. Again, that's if you haven't tried anything. But um, like if you're a lemon lime person and you don't want to get a raspberry, like try and figure out what you can eat, drink or eat tomorrow. Um, just try it for taste because um, – you see a lot of people using a lot of different things. And, you know, if you had to use a, a guide um, for something like this, maybe a gel every 30 to 40 minutes is a common kind of practice. Um, and when you take that first one, um, your body can only process a certain amount of calories after a certain amount of time. You're not going to be able to take in more calories. You're always burning more than, than you can take in and process. So um, I would definitely... They say when you're training, be hungry. The week before, you should be just a little bit hungry. And the night before a race, you should not be hungry at all. <laughs> so eat tomorrow. Um, and uh, don't be afraid of breakfast the next day. But again, if you don't eat Mexican food, don't go out for burritos tomorrow night. Um, so then, um, and I just posted in the chat room a couple links to Steve's articles. Uh, chat room, chat board, whatever it is. I think I just born on dated myself um so then uh oh dirty water and water uh quality so um the water quality of the hudson is um very good um uh they i think five years ago um they said you could eat the fish again um and uh i actually uh, swam, I did the New York city triathlon and I swam a mile in the Hudson and I was fine. So, um, uh, I didn't see any problems with the water quality in the Hudson. Now the, the Harlem river, uh, is a little different. Um, Harlem river was, um, and it may have changed, uh, was a little dirtier. Um, I don't know if more water gets stuck between the two rivers, but going by Yankee Stadium, all I remember is going by Chips Ahoy wrappers, pieces of hot dogs, and mustard wrappers. Um, <laughs> and um, so, um, and other things. And um, uh, so I, I fell in in the Harlem, and um, I came up with, uh, with stuff on me, and it was, it was kind of nasty. So don't fall in the Harlem River. The Hudson River is fine. The East River's um, not as good as the Hudson, but um, you know it's it's okay. Um, I don't think they recommend you get any travelers vaccines or anything. I mean, it's not like people are you know. I I, I don't think you have to be concerned. It's you know that you know they have a bad reputation sometimes, but it's not that bad. Um, and um, you know you're definitely going to want to spray off when you're done, you know, take a shower and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, like anywhere else. Um, so, uh, Trish, do you have any suggestions? We, David asks if we hit the wind and chop and thanks David for the question, uh, coming down the Hudson, are you better off towards the middle or the back of the board? Um, which is different than out in the middle or the side um, the board itself. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that is a good question. I mean, you definitely want to, especially at that point in the race too, your legs are going to be pretty tired feel free kind of shuffling your feet a little bit, you know, get used to moving around because you might have to move back a little bit and then position yourself over. Once you get over a wave, maybe forward, you know, but if it's, if it's chop, uh, sometimes I just kind of plant in the middle and, and see what happens, you know, see where your nose is. If it's diving in too much under the water, then move back a little bit. Everyone's board rides a little differently. So I can't say like hundred percent what to do. Um, but feel, you know, feel comfortable, moving your feet back and forth then too, to make that decision. Um, because you know, one thing isn't going to be like, you know, golden for you. You got to kind of play around with it too. Um, it's a good question. And, and your, your line at that point also, 
if you want, you know, if you want to be out a little bit, you're going to be a little more into the wind, but if you're going to go to the left a little and hug that, uh, that corner, um, you might not have as much wind, but you won't have as much current bringing you there either. So that's a decision you'll have to make too, and kind of negotiate that as you go. Um, yeah, yeah we're going to a definitive answer. We've got a good, uh, question from David Castellani about drafting and he's not he has very little experience with drafting, but he wants to know if, if you don't draft, is the course doable in the six hours? Definitely. Yeah. Um, I, in the past couple of years, there haven't been like very many female paddlers that have paddled. So I'm really happy to see more out there and hopefully have more company out there and we can all draft. Um, but in past years, I haven't seen any female paddlers out there. So, um, uh, you know, you just kind of take it upon yourself to get in your mental mode and and go. And you can definitely um, have it within you to to finish that race. You know, race your race, you can finish it. Um, and then if you can uh, draft with fellow paddlers along the way, it makes it a whole lot better. You know, um, I was lucky enough to draft with uh, someone last year too, and we had a great time talking and everything. And uh, it just makes the time go by a lot faster. Yep. And the... Um, uh one of the things that you might want to think as a strategy, if you're going to take a little longer on the course, um, you'll actually have more aid from the current on the Hudson. So if you think about this, the way that I looked at the course was I have current with me at the beginning and I have current with me at the end. So what I did was I tried to make the most of the current at the beginning without killing myself knowing that the middle area, I was really going to have to give a push. And that once I got to the Hudson, I was going to have current too. So I kind of, my strategy was the middle of the race was where I was going to put in the real hard work. I mean, I wanted to get a good start for sure. Um, but you have so much current in the beginning. And then the end, I knew that I, I didn't have to save as much. It's not like at the end, I was going to go against the current at the end. I knew if I just buckled down, um, you know, got low, that the current was going to basically take me home. If I just stopped paddling, I knew I would get to the finish, um, which was comforting in a way. Um, but with the wind in your face, um, it's, it's hard to tell. One of the things that, again, having a GPS on your board, we were talking about preparing your, your board. Um, if you have your, uh, like a Garmin or a speed coach, uh, mounted on your board, this is another place where it really helps because, when you're on the Hudson and you feel like you're dying and you're tired, you can at least look down and say, oh, well, I'm already I'm going four miles an hour or I'm going five miles an hour um, and I'm not doing much work. Um, I found on the Hudson going in the opposite direction that if I paddled as hard as I could and I was with the current and against the wind, if I paddled as hard as I humanly possibly could, I was going 8.3 miles an hour in this one section, just a small section. If I basically paddled lightly, I was going 7.8. So I know that's a half a mile an hour difference, but that's faster than I had ever paddled. So I thought, yeah. well, if I just keep it clean and go with this current and not kill myself, I'm still going to be doing really well. Um, so you, if you have a constant view of your GPS, you can gauge what you need to do. And again, if you're in um, fast or slow water, because if mentally you know you have an outgoing tide on the Hudson, you should be going faster than maybe four or five miles an hour. So if you see you're going two, um, you're in the wrong spot. You're in an eddy. Uh, you're not in the current. So planning for that um, and looking at your instant um, feedback on how fast you're going will let you know if you're in the right spot on the river. So um, it's really helpful. I, I can't highly rec I highly recommend you have your GPS in a place where you can see it. Um, so, and, um, so, uh, Trish, is there anything else that you, you want to want to add? Because we've gone through all the questions um, and but as far as like, oh, well, I know, um, as far as like the drafting also, um, they, they will make an announcement the day of too. Cause I know it's, it's still a WPA race, but it's a WPA like special event. So the rules change, you know, like slightly, um, as far as like, you know, paddling on your knees and everything too. So just pay attention in the beginning that like they'll, they'll tell you all of the, the rules and everything too. Um, I can't remember exactly what, you know, they all are. Um, but it, it, in the beginning of the race, they'll tell you all of the, the drafting rules and everything too. So 
um, try to pay attention to Assume that. nothing. Don't assume that any of the rules that you've lived with for the past eight years are going to be apply. I'm sure many of them will, but if you go in assuming that you can't uh, draft off the same board class, they may not have that rule. Um, you may be able to draft anybody. Um, just make sure you listen to the specific rules. And um, um, and so if I'm going to sum up a couple of things for me, it's look around. <laughs> Trish talked about looking at Yankee Stadium. Just take the time to look around and realize that you're paddling around um, one of the biggest cities in the world. And it's insane that you're allowed to do that. I still can't believe they let people do that. And we get to do that. It's kind of <laughs> awesome. Um, second thing is uh, definitely be self-supportive. Make sure you bring enough water and food. Don't rely on the boats because um, if you do, you could be disappointed and then you're going to be blaming other people. Um, and third, um, just like Trish said, there's something bigger coming at you. Give them the right of way, um, even if you think you do. Just just be safe. Um, and on the East River, remember, there's um, seaplanes. <laughs> We got buzzed by a seaplane over by 38th Street. So they don't, you know, you've got ferries, but the seaplanes are also going to be coming from behind you. So uh, they'll miss you. All right, Trish, what do you think? Um, that's pretty much it. Guys, just have a great time out there. You know, it's um, it, it's a very special event and, uh, and it's for charity too. I mean, raising a ton of money for autism um, and the Surfers and Biomental Alliance. So it's a... Uh, not only a great event, but but we get to um, get to raise money doing it. So. Yeah, that's that's. You remember, remember why you're out there, um, and uh, they have they've raised so much money over the past ten years. It's an unbelievable um, charity, and the Surfers Environmental Alliance they just do such a great job. So make sure you thank all the volunteers, um, thank the race organizers, um, and realize that they are put a ton of time over the past 10 years in organizing this and making sure that you're all safe and having a great time and raising money. So, um, thank you everybody. This takes a little while to, um, uh, to process the video and then I have to upload it. So hopefully I'll have this uploaded by first thing in the morning. It usually takes, you know, maybe three or four hours. Um, and, um, anybody who's thinking about doing this next year, um, one of the questions is when do I start training? Um, it's 26 miles, um, start today. So, um, get out there and start battling. Um, and, um, yeah, it's a great charity. So thank you everybody for being so patient. You know, this is our second webinar with paddle monster. We're working out the kinks. Um, and, um, uh, and special thank Trish. Thank you so much for being on this, Steve, wherever you are yep. wandering through New York city, looking for Wi-Fi. Um, the presentation was amazing. I'm going to post that right now on the Paddle Monster uh, Facebook page. Um, share it. Um, and Steve, really great job. And sorry uh, about the technical stuff. We'll figure this all out. So thank you. And thanks, Paddle Monster. Anybody who wants a free month that's looking at this that doesn't have it, email me and I'll give you a code. Um, try it out. See what you think and let us know. Cool. Good, Trish. Cool. All right. Everybody. All right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody.